We have had the custom here at the City of Marion for the last 20 years of reciting the chapter of Our Lady of Sorrows on Wednesdays during Lent. And then on Fridays, of course, we have the Stations of the Cross. And the reason is because during Lent, as we meditate on the sufferings, the pains that our Lord experienced in his passion, we should also call to mind the sorrows of his Blessed Mother. Because Our Lady united her grief with the sufferings of her Son for our salvation. The Fathers of the Church speak about how orderly God is in all his works. There is a beautiful design, you might say, in all of God's works. And applying this to our Lady of Sorrows, our downfall, the downfall of the human race, was brought about by the cooperation of man and a woman. Adam and Eve both ate the forbidden fruit, and thus they plunged the human race into a state of the state of sin, or at least original sin, and the loss of that innocence and the gifts that have been given to them, the fallen state of man. And this fallen state, or this sin, was to re be repaired by the Redeemer. But since a man and a woman brought about our downfall, it was also fitting that there be a woman who would unite with this man in bringing about the restoration of the human race, the redemption. And so the fathers of the church, the theologians, refer to Our Lady as co redemptrices And it's very important that we understand what is meant by that. And that is that God will to accept her sorrows and to unite those with his own passion. But Our Lady was not needed by an absolute necessity. Rather, she was necessary by God's will. Our Lord could have shed one tear, or offered one prayer for the redemption of mankind, and that would have been an infinite value. So he did not need, in an absolute sense, our Blessed Mother's sufferings. But again, getting back to this idea of the orderly arrangement of divine providence, he willed to join her sorrows with his passion. And we recall the words of um, Simeon at the presentation of our Lord in the temple. And that was when he said to our lady, Thy own soul, sword shall pierce. And what a striking expression, strange, unusual terminology. He didn't say your heart will be pierced, but your soul will be pierced with a sword. There is a beautiful statue of Our Lady of Sorrows that the sisters have in Mount St. Michael. It used to be ours, it used to be in the priests and brothers' house in Port of Angle, Mill Street. But it's a statue of Our Lady of Sorrows and it has a sword plunging right in the statue right where her heart is. In fact, the new Reign of Mary that's being printed right now will have that picture of that statue on the cover. It's a very striking, uh, makes a striking impression. The sorrows of our blessed mother. So let us strive during Lent, as we reflect upon the passion of our Lord, to also reflect upon the sorrows of our lady. Her lifelong sorrows, we have the seven sorrows, but in particular, her sorrows during the course of the passion. Many saints sanctify themselves by a devotion to our lady of sorrows. Last Wednesday was the feast of Saint Gabriel of our mother of sorrows who was a brother, a religious, who died, I think, around the year 1862 or thereabouts. And in Italy, at the young age of 24, he became a great saint, and one of the means was his tremendous devotion to our Lady of Sorrows. But another one I'd like to mention is the seven holy founders, which we also had recently, about three weeks ago, the 12th of February, is very unique because most religious orders are founded by one individual. So you have the Franciscan order founded by St. Francis or the Dominican or the Benedictine 
or the Carthusian or whatever, a holy founder who began the order. But the Servites, as they are called, is an order that was started by seven men. And these seven pious men lived in Florence, in Italy, in the early 1200s. And they were uh, wealthy, but they were very devoted. And they joined themselves together. They would go off to a, a hermitage and pray together. And a lady appeared to each of them and encouraged them to lead the world and to honor her. So that was the first step. And they began to live together and live a religious life. And then she appeared a second time. In fact, it was on Good Friday in the year 1240 that she appeared to all of them and asked them to found an order in honor of her sorrows. And again, it's called the Sarai Order. But I want to read a little bit about her life and this fact from the Breviary Lessons for February 12th. To avoid crowds of people. So they first began, like St. Francis did, they went begging. They went from door to door, and they would spend the time in prayer. And the people hailed them as saints. In fact, some children said, it is the servants of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's where they got the name of their order, the Sarahites. So because of the crowds of people, and led by their love of solitude, they all withdrew to the solitude of Monte Scenario, and there adopted a manner of life almost heavenly, for they lived in caves, took no food but herbs and water, and subdued their bodies by vigils and other austerities, continually meditating on the passion of Christ and the sorrows of his afflicted mother. One good Friday, when they were absorbed in fervent prayer, the Blessed Virgin appeared to them, in, to, to them all the second time, and showed them the somber habit they were to adopt, and told them that she wished them to found a new order of religious in the church, whose mission was to cultivate and spread devotion to the sorrows which she endured beneath the cross of the Lord. And it goes on to explain that. So it's unique in that it is a religious order that was inspired by Our Lady, Our Lady requesting it. And those of you who are familiar with, and some of you may wear, what is called the five-way scapular, one of those five is, the, is a black scapular. And that is the scapular of the Sarahite order. I don't believe they were uh, real populous in the United States before that, until I know they had a center in Chicago. And there also is the beautiful outdoor grotto and shrine in Portland, which is run by the Sarahite, owned by the Sarahite. And I don't know what other works they did, but their spirituality again is to honor, not just during Lent, but throughout the year, the sorrows of our Blessed Mother, and to console our lady for all that she suffered, because her son suffered in his body and his soul, but physically, she suffered in the heart and soul. And I've mentioned this before in past years, but I want to quote um, some beautiful statement on the sanctifying value of devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows. The graces which our Lord promises to those who are devoted to the sorrows of His Blessed Mother are very great. St. Alphonsus, in his discourse on the Dolors of Mary, states, quote, It was revealed to St. Elizabeth of Hungary that some years after the Blessed Virgin was assumed into heaven, St. John, the beloved disciple, was seized with an ardent desire to see her again. This favor was granted him. His dear mother appeared to him in company with our divine Lord. Then St. John heard Mary asking of her son some special graces for those who were devoted to her dolors. Our Lord promised the four following graces. Number one, those who invoke the Heavenly Mother through her sorrows will obtain true sorrow for their sins before death. Number two, our Savior will protect them in their tribulations, especially at the hour of death. Number three, he will impress upon them the memory of his passion and will reward them for it in heaven. And number four, he will commit such devout servants to the hands of Mary, that she may dispose of them according to her pleasure and obtain for them all the graces she desires. Besides these great graces, Father Faber enumerates others which are obtained through devotion to Mary sorrows. This devotion has a remarkable connection with great interior holiness. It reveals the emptiness of worldly joys. 
worldliness finds no soul harder to attack than one entrenched in the sorrows of our blessed lady. The world can graft itself upon nothing in this devotion. It gives us a permanent share in the sorrow for sin which Jesus and Mary felt. It keeps our thoughts close to Jesus Christ and to him crucified. It communicates to our souls the spirit of the cross and gives us strength to endure our own sufferings with resignation to the Holy Will of God. This devotion is wholly covered with the precious blood of Jesus and leads us directly into the depths of the heart of our Savior. Anyone who during his lifetime has cherished compassion for this afflicted mother may consider this as a most sure sign of predestination. There are many other beautiful quotes and statements in this booklet on devotion to our Lady of Sorrows. But let us all make an effort during Lent. And you do that by joining us every Wednesday for the chapel. Some call it the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady. And we certainly can pray it as well. Of course, the, the Sorrowful Mysteries, making the Stations of the Cross, reading about the Passion of Our Lord, a meditation book, or spiritual reading book. But let us also reflect upon the sorrows of our Blessed Mother and offer to her our compassion that she suffered so much and promising her that we will not offend our Lord again because our offenses against our Lord also cause her sorrows. So it is a wonderfully sanctifying practice. Let us observe that, especially this life.